How we doing? I don't know if you saw that for that split moment, my iPad would not turn on. Gonna have to freestyle the whole thing right there. It was close. For years, just so you know, I always had the printed backup, and about two months ago, I'm like, for 10 years, nothing's happened. It almost happened right there. <laughs> uh, mothers, we love you. Justin, your words are so good, man. Um, thank you for that. Hey, my name's Derek. If we haven't met, uh, one of the teachers, one of the pastors here. Last week, we started this journey into what we are calling worship slash justice or worship and, and justice. And these really are two ideas that the scriptures, both the Old and the New Testament, they hold them closely together. And so that's what we're going after. Because I think there's times we think about worship in its own context, and then we think about justice as this, this other thing. Uh, but think about when Jesus was asked this question. You can go to the next slide. Jesus was asked this. It's a very, probably if you've been around church, well-known question that Jesus was uh, given. But it says this. A teacher of the law said to Jesus, Rabbi or teacher, which is the greatest command in the law? So that's the question. And then Jesus answers. He says this. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest command. Now here's the thing. He doesn't stop there. He connects something to that. And this isn't a separate idea. It's deeply connected with what he just said. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law, so all the laws of God that we know is for us the Old Testament and the prophets, so everything that God told the prophets to pass on to the nation of Israel, he says, all of it, all of that, the words of God to the prophets and the law hangs on these two commands, all of it. So the heart of worship its very essence is, is to love God, right? And that's what the first thing that Jesus says, the greatest command, he said the second one is like it. And the heart of justice is to love your neighbor. So a, another way to kind of look at it, in other words, faithful acts of loving your neighbor do not stand in opposition of faithful acts of worshiping God. But what Jesus is doing in that passage is he's actually taking those two and he's connecting the two ideas into one. And so that's what we're going after in this series. We'll talk about worship today, worship next week, and then four weeks on justice. But all of it will be connected. Mark chapter 14 today, verse 3 through 9. It will be on the screen or you can turn on your phones. Open up your Bibles, unroll your scrolls. So here's what I wanna do. I actually wanna start in the last verse of the story. I want the last verse to kinda of be known as we go through this narrative and the story in front of us unfolds. Here's the last passage of this story. This is a quote from Jesus. And truly, so he's saying, hey, listen to this. I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, massive language, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Now, even in this like small little snapshot of this story, not knowing the entire context of what has, has happened all before this, for me, when I read this, this is like important, it's captivating, it's riveting. And I don't know about you, but it makes me ask the question to this statement, what did this woman do? What did she say that it made Jesus respond in this, this way? Of, of saying wherever the gospel story is told, and then in the literal language of the original Greek, this woman will be spoken of 
and it will be a memorial to her. And guess what? Here we are. Speaking of who? Of her. Just as Jesus said. And here's an idea with that. This isn't just a story. What we're about to see in a few passages is a spiritual reality that I think what Jesus is saying is that he doesn't want this to be overlooked. He doesn't want this to be missed, but he wants this to be something that followers of Jesus learn and they embody from this woman. Mark chapter 14. We'll start in three, but let me just open kind of the scene for you. It's two days before one of the highest, most important festivals for all the Jews. It's known as Passover. So imagine maybe on the Christian calendar, it's a little different, but imagine for us, it's like December 23rd, two days before Christmas. All the things that you're preparing for, all the things you're thinking through, all the things that you're doing, maybe there's family in town. The, the, the thing is that this is a very important moment in the story. Two days before Passover, two days before the moment that we know that Jesus went to the cross. And that's the scene. That's the opening of the story as we step into verse 3 of Mark 14. And while he, Jesus, was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he, Jesus, was reclining at the table. So the scene opens up now to this bigger story where in this community that's about two miles, they said it was about a saddest day walk, one day walk from the, bis the bustling, packed city of Jerusalem. Because remember, Passover is about to happen, so everyone is there. But Jesus is in Bethany. Bethany was a little different than Jerusalem. It was this looked down upon community. Now, you get to pick your interpretation of how you want to define the word Bethany. It either means the house of figs, or it's interpreted actually as the house of affliction and the house of poverty. So yes, I know we are in the worship focus of the worship and justice. However, I don't want us to miss this because what we see in this opening line, this opening of the story, is Jesus is choosing to be in close proximity of misery and poverty and affliction in the house of Simon in the house of someone who had, and we'll get to that in a moment, who had leprosy. Now, just so we can get to know Simon a little bit, two things. Simon has this title given to him by Mark, at least, Simon the leper. Lepers were considered unclean. So Simon knew just recently in his life, what it meant to not be a part of society. He knew what it meant to be an outcast. He knew what it felt like to be pushed outside, to be marginalized, to be one of those people who were not welcome at the table. He fully understood this firsthand. This was a part of his story. And I think as a community, I know this is where our hearts break. This is where we should have, I think, some spiritual agitation kind of in our souls because we realize the most beautiful thing that was given to all of humanity is the gospel of Jesus. Are you with me? Yeah. And it's this, that God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The most important message, the most beautiful message to all of humanity for you and for me and for our community. If that's the most beautiful message that Christ died for you and me and our community when we were still stuck in our sins, then here is where our heart breaks. Here's where our souls will not rest. 
Because if you spend any time in our community, you know that there are many Simons still in our community who believe today that they are still outside the love of God, that they are outcasts of the grace and the power of salvation of the cross of Christ. And so it's a part of, I think, our story of why we're trying to, and God's trying to plant us more in the community. But it's also for a call, a call for all of us, that if we've been saved by the greatest message and the greatest reality, we want to bring that message to those who feel like they're outside of it. And to, for those who are outside of it are usually outside of this space. Two, Simon, past tense, had leprosy. How do we know that? Because you have some people at this party, talks about it in verse one, I didn't say it. But there are people who are religious leaders. Was, this always breaks my heart too. It's the priests, it's the pastors, it's, it's, the, it's the scribes, it's the Pharisees, it's the lawyer of the law, it's the scholars, right? It's all the people who thought they knew God really well. They would not be caught in the house of a leper because they would be considered unclean too by sharing a meal to being at that table. So even though Mark gives him this title of Simon the leper, here's what we know. Simon must have had an encounter with Jesus, with the life-changing, the life-altering, healing presence of Jesus. Are you with me? Because he's no longer a leper. They would not be in his presence. And so where we are in the story, we're in Simon's house. There's a dinner party. The house is packed. The guest list is diverse. And Jesus is there. Eating, drinking, reclining at the table. And I wonder, could it be? Like, could this dinner party actually be Simon's response to what Jesus did for him. And I would ask this, what is worship? Can worship be a dinner party for Jesus? Is this not Simon's worship? Responding to the healing power and presence of Jesus and, and the, the transformation that Jesus brought to his life? Could it be that Simon's actually inviting Jesus deeper into his life, to the center of his life, his table, his eating, his drinking, and even his reclining? Does it not sound like the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians? Well, if you eat or if you drink, and then he says, okay, whatever you do, I love that. Do it for what? The glory of God. And so I think this dinner party in itself is worship. It's treasuring Jesus. It's a response to what Jesus did. Continuing in verse 3, Simon's there, Jesus is there, dinner party, the room is packed. And there's probably one potentially who wasn't invited, maybe. A woman, verse three, came with an alabaster flask. This is a perfume vase of ointment of pure nard, very costly. She broke the flask and poured it over his head, over the head of Jesus. Do any of you ever like to enter a room alone? Like, you don't have anyone with you. Do you ever like to enter a room alone where it's packed and you don't know anybody? You know what I'm saying? I think for most of us, I'm like, like, I'm pretty extroverted, but there's still a hesitation in me. Like, like if I were to walk in this room, I didn't know any of you, and this was a house party. Like, there's going to be hesitation. I'm walking in solo. You have no idea who I am. Are you with me? Does that make sense? So think about this woman. Is she nervous? Read into it, absolutely. 
I would believe that maybe she is like, has these moments of hesitation of even coming into the space. But I think so far she's come over the biggest hurdle. The hurdle was just getting here, getting to the house of Simon. But I would say it's the love of Jesus that got her this far. And I would imagine if you could look from the room that everyone's gathered to the outside courtyard of Simon's home. I would imagine you've, been, you've seen this lady standing there for some time. She's waiting in the wing of the outside courtyard, holding on to the perfume vase. And she's contemplating, she's calculating her pathway through the house See, Jesus is there. Maybe she can see him, but she realizes in order to get to Jesus, she's gonna have to be seen by everyone. And if they see her, they're gonna see the thing that she came here to do. And if they see the thing that she came here to do, she's gonna stand in the barriers and the judgment of their opinions of the things that she just did. You'll see what happens. And so she's waiting. I think many times when we talk about worship, and I'm not talking just about singing, I'm talking about reverence, response to Jesus, treasuring who God is. I think many times, follow me, because I'm speaking for myself, that sometimes the opinion or the perceived opinion of others holds me back from fully pouring myself out to the Lord. Are you with me? Maybe even in this context. So let's push pause on the story. Let's leave the woman at the, the wing of the courtyard. Let's let her stand there for a little bit. If we can, this isn't in the story, but let's back up. Let's go back to her house Let's go back to her room. This is gonna sound creepy, but just follow me. <laughs> and if you were to look at her in her room before this moment of Mark chapter 14, what would you see? You would see a young girl in her room holding a vase a very expensive perfume from India and she's contemplating what she's about to do that evening. She's going through it over and over in her mind of all the different ways this may play out, good and bad. This was premeditated. This was not impulsive. She didn't just go over to the house of Simon. This was all planned out before. What she's doing pub or privately in her room is intentionally going to be brought publicly. And so I would ask this question. Is the spirit of God moving in her? Because for me, and I don't think we believe this, I don't think she's like conjuring this up in her flesh of this is how I'm gonna worship God. I think she's standing in her room before this moment of Simon's house, holding on to the most expensive thing, the most valuable thing, her security, the thing that she owns that is her safety net if anything happens financially. And she's holding on to it, thinking through how she can worship the Lord by the using of this perfume vase. So what's happen, happening privately is about to go public and it's intentional. The spirit of God, don't get it wrong, is moving in this woman in her room, preparing her for worship for the future. It's not like you just show up for worship. God does something beforehand. And so my bigger question would be this. We read the story and she gets to Simon's house and, and I'm gonna ruin the story, but she breaks open the vase upon the head of Christ, and we go, she's worshiping. But I would ask, when did worship actually start?
Worship, next slide please. Worship first begins in our hearts, then on our lips, then in our actions. Worship is always a catalyst. Worship is always a posture of the heart first before we sing or before we act. First, our worship begins in our personal time with Jesus, which is a big statement for our community of being with Jesus. Every, we believe everything comes from that. New family comes from being with Jesus. Being salt and light to the world comes from being with Jesus. So our personal, private time with Jesus is the catalyst. That's where worship begins, and then it's brought here. Then it's brought publicly. It doesn't start here. It starts in your time with Christ. So let's stop looking in her room and go back to the party. The room is packed. For you introverts, this is where you get nervous. Walking in solo, she walks into the house. And all of the eyes of all the others in this house party, one by one, are on her. But her eyes are on the one. Now, as she walks in, this is one of those moments in life, we've all experienced it. The room is packed. There's a crowd all around you. The noise level in the room is super loud. But there's this moment for some reason that all the noise and all of the sound in that room, in one moment, it drops out. We call it, in our culture, awkward silence. <laughs> the sound drops, and it wasn't her intention, but the attention of all the people at the house party in this room are now looking at this woman standing over the one she came here for while he is reclining on the ground. And all the eyes are focused. All the voices are silenced. You can hear a pin drop in the room. Are you there? And then the silence is met with the cracking, the breaking of the perfume vase. And in that moment, when all the eyes are on her and the room is silence and Jesus is reclining and she cracks open the perfume vase, in that moment, she's enamored with Jesus. She took the thing that was most costly to her. She pours it out. Get this picture, not a drip. She cracks the vase and pours it out lavishly. She pours out everything. She gives everything that she had upon Jesus. over his head, down his beard, down his neck, and onto the cloak of Jesus as he reclined at the table. And so I ask myself, all that had just happened, would I do that? And if not, what is holding me back? 
And when I ask myself that question, I'm sure you're asking yourself the same. Would I do that? If not, what would hold me back? Breaking through the inhibitions, breaking through the opinion of others, breaking through what she knew as her safety and her security in order to worship the one that she came here for. You go to the next slide. The breaking leads to the pouring out of the offering of our whole selves. It starts with breaking past the opinions, breaking past inhibitions, just like the vase, it couldn't be poured out, it had to be broken first. First we come broken and then we pour out and the pouring out is the offering of who we really are. Are you with me? And so don't miss this because I think we see the oil as kind of a, a temporal act, a physical act not only was the pouring out of the oil an external act, the act of the pouring out the oil was also a spiritual posture. It was a picture of what was happening in this woman on the inside. When she poured out the oil upon the head of Jesus, she was pouring out herself, and that's what's most important. It wasn't about the oil. It was a picture, it was a metaphor of her worship. She was pouring out herself. The pouring out of our worship is intrinsically connected to the pouring out of ourselves. It's deeply connected. So when you pour yourself out, and worship again isn't, no one's singing here by the way, but even in the context of music and singing, when we pour ourselves out in worship, it's deeply connected to us pouring out ourselves, our whole selves, and that's the goal of worship. We don't hold anything back. That's why it feels sometimes risky, or it feels like we're not safe anymore, or we live in the barriers of the opinions of other people of what are they gonna think? Because think about this. What would you do this morning before I told the story? If you saw me walking over to Dave, because he has really nice hair, and putting oil upon Dave, just like cracking open a bottle of perfume during music, during worship, and just pouring on Dave. Now I understand Dave's not Jesus. But I'm sure a lot of us would be like, what is going on at my church? <laughs> I don't know how many of us would be like, oh, we're all about that. That's normal. Are, are you with me? Like maybe that helps our context a little bit. So you can kind of sympathize maybe with some other people in the room. But for her, there was nothing that would keep her back from worshiping Jesus. Why? That's what I was trying to get into. Why was there nothing holding her back? She broke through all of it. It's because she knew whose presence she was in. That's the heart of worship right there. Something changes when you know you are in the presence of the eternal creator and the savior. The one who holds all things, the one that's always been, still is, and will always be. The one who has the power to redeem all that is bad in our world and to use it somehow for his good, for the completion of all things. She understood that. Tangibly, he's right there in Simon's house, in that room, at the dinner party, reclining at that table. She knew whose presence that she was in, and that's where worship is unleashed. That's where worship of our, of, from ourselves is poured out lavishly upon God. Listen, to her, 
when she comes into the presence of Jesus. And I always have to think about this for myself. For her, the grace of God, her past life, and now who she is in Christ Jesus, and if we follow Christ, we all have that same story. But for her, the grace of Christ isn't just some theological concept. It's not some statement of doctrine. It's not just some study, and it's not just some type of belief. It's not enough for her. The grace of Jesus is an uncomparable truth. For her, it's a tangible reality. She knows that she's been saved. She knows that she's messed up. She knows that she's broken, that she was a sinner, and she's been saved by Jesus. And this is pre-cross. But it's crazy, you'll see in a little bit. She actually knew the cross was gonna happen. She might have been the only one that believed that at this time, which is crazy. That's why she didn't hold back in worship. And sometimes, like, that reality, we're gonna take communion at the end when I'm done here in a few moments. And by moments, I mean like one hour. I'm just joking. <laughs> but sometimes that reality just hits me. And I'm at home, or it's on Sunday, or I'm doing something else. And those moments are moments of step into worship. Because her story is my story. Her story is your story. It's the same grace. It's the same Jesus. She's seen her Savior. She experienced forgiveness. She has seen his glory. She is a new creation. Let me ask this when you worship. How extravagant is too extravagant for the Savior? There's no level. There's no stopping point. Oh, that's, that's too extreme. That's too extravagant for the Savior of, of everything. There's no ceiling on it. You can go to the next slide. Worship is a response to the revelation of who Jesus is. Now leave it there. So there's more to this, this thought that I came up with, but I wanted to isolate it there just for a moment. Worship is a response to the revelation of who Jesus is. Yeah, period. That's it. That's why nothing held her back. She knows it's been revealed to her who Jesus is, and she's responding. But here's kind of the second part I wanted to add to that. So the first line is the same. Worship is a response to the revelation of who Jesus is and to recognize who we are. I don't want to make worship about me or about you, but I do realize in worship, if I understand and it's revealed to me who Jesus is, it also puts me, I'll say it this way, in my place. I think she walked from her home to the wing of the courtyard, into the packed house, into the table that Jesus is reclining at, because she's going, who am I? I'm not worried about what people think about the way I worship Jesus. Who am I? But she recognizes who Jesus is. When I come to the altar of the throne of Jesus, yes, I'm a child of God. I'm a son of the Savior, for sure. But I'm like, this isn't beating me down. It's, but who am I? I have nothing to prove. I am dirt or clay in the potter's hands that he put his breath into me, and now I am. That's who I am. Now, there are some other people at the party the people that she had to walk through. Verse four. There were some who said to themselves, that's important, it's called gossip, by the way. 
Not to her, not to Jesus. They said to themselves indignantly. Now, by the way, this word indignantly doesn't mean anger. It's not rendered anger. The word actually means that it's this response of someone going, this just grieves me too much. It's actually how it's rendered in the literal language. So let me read it in that language. Here's what they're saying. The people who are speaking to themselves are going, this just grieves me too much. Why was the ointment wasted like that? This just grieves me so much. For the ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. This just grieves me so much. Here's my interpretation. That's a narcissistic manipulation of taking all the sympathy out of this room for the woman and putting it on yourself. What she's doing, it's actually making me grieve. It's about me. That's how that word's rendered. So it's not anger at this point. It's actually everyone looking at the woman and them pulling the attention and people going, oh, I'm sorry, you're grieved. I'm so so sorry. They're making it about them. And then... The last four words there, and they scolded her. Now, I don't know how this works out, but the literal language there is to snort like a horse, is what it says. I don't know. I'm not going to try that. But I would say it's like maybe like like scoffing, you know. (laughs) This grieves me so much. She could have sold it. This just grieves me. I'm so sorry that grieves you. Like, this is what's happening in this room. And then they look at her and, poof, towards what? Her worship of Jesus. And these are religious people. I was wondering, how did they know, I don't have an answer, but how did they know what this perfume was? It's questions I ask when I read these narratives. Like, it's not like she grabbed the Perfume vase, and it was like, it said pure nard on the side of it or something, right? I mean, but somehow they knew the smell. And think about this. This wasn't like a little spritz. Like, this was like crack open the whole thing and anointing a pouring out. So we don't go to the mall too often in our family, but when we go uh, to the mall, I don't know why we have this. We always walk through Macy's to get to the mall. I don't know why. It's like, I realize I'm getting old when I park at the, again, I don't go to the mall too much, but I park at the same spot and then I walk through Macy's. But um, many times when we walk through Macy's, my boys and I, we walk through the, they always have like the cosmetics for the women, like at the, kind of the, depending if you're going into the mall, the cosmetics are right there as you exit Macy's, or if you're in the mall, they're at the entrance to grab attention. But as we're walking by, I usually get to know my personality a little bit. I usually try to grab like one of the women's like perfume, perfumes and spray it on my boys as they like go by. <laughs> and you're trying to pick out a good one like Wonderstruck by, you know, Taylor Swift or something, whatever. <laughs> because here's the thing, it's so awesome having three boys. You spray a couple, a couple like spritz sprays on them and the rest of the day they're like, I can't even stand next to people because if I'm like 10, 12, maybe 15 feet, two sprays of that stuff, like they can smell you. <laughs> imagine this. Like imagine if my boys like went by and I like took the cap off. <laughs> How much would you smell it? So at this dinner party, in this room packed with people, I would imagine there at first was this, this smell of like Near Eastern food. It was a dinner party, right? This is the Near East. And I would imagine that it was consumed by this overwhelming smell of perfume. Like overwhelming. The whole bottle was poured out. And when the perfume struck the senses of the people, the others in the room. It got their attention. And here's where the questioning started. 
is she pouring out the whole bottle? Remember to themselves. And then the calculation started. Is that pure nard? Do you know how much that cost? Do you realize what she could have done with that? And then the whispering judgments started. I call these people, by the way, binocular people. They're people who, they're in every, almost every room, they're not here. <laughs> every room except here. But they're, they're almost in every room. They're people who will only look at you from across the room and they'll always stand at a distance making judgments. They'll never come talk to you. And so, from a distance, at this dinner party, they have their binoculars on. They're watching this woman worship. And as they see her response to Jesus, they are filtering her response, listen, through their preferences of worship, their past traditions of worship, and their, their experiences of worship. And quickly they get to this place, the binocular people in the corner of this house party, that they are quick to judge that her worship is not how you're supposed to worship God. But they never would tell her. They would never have a conversation about it. They're the gatekeepers of worship. So here's what's interesting. We actually know her worship response was not in opposition at all to the way of Jesus. And we know that because of the line that we read at the very beginning in verse 9. Jesus said, what you did will be known, will be spoken of as a memorial to you. So here's the question. If the way that she worshiped, entering this room and cracking open the vase of expensive perfume and lavishly pouring out the entire bottle on the head of Jesus was actually congruent with the way of worshiping Jesus, why were they upset? They were upset because it was incongruent with their opinion of worship with their preferences, with their styles, with their traditions and their experiences. They were making it about the mode and not who it's for. These binocular people, they have, they have their own opinion of what honors God the most and the best. And they're saying, it doesn't fit our form. So here's something I was thinking about. What form? What's the form? If you have time, if you want, look at moments of worship from the very beginning, of the pages of Genesis all the way through Revelation. Humans, angels, creatures, worshiping. And tell me what the form is. It's very, very tough to say it's this. So I was thinking to myself, does God care? I don't know. This is my thought. Does God care whether we sing a new song or if we harmonize melodies of old? Does God care if we use historical pews or if we buy some new, hip, cool, mid-century modern chairs? Does God prefer the harpsichord over a compelling worship experience? Does God prefer the combo of guitar and drums over ancient chants? What does God really care about in worship? Is it the form? Is it the mode? Go to the next slide. Our worship isn't, this is pretty simple. 
It's an idea I had. Our worship isn't about the music. It's not about our traditions. Worship isn't about our preferences, but only, underline that. Like, remember, underline that in your pages, in your mind, in your life, but only about God and about what he has done. That's it. If worship is about anything else, it's not worship. It's about God and what he has done. That's it. That's, again, why this woman could break through all the barriers, because it was about Jesus, the grace that she experienced, not about the opinion of others. We'll close here. So in real time, the dinner party is still silent. You can still hear the pin drop. And there's this overwhelming perfume smell in the air. But Jesus said, I love these first three words. And sometimes, is this not justice, by the way? And sometimes we have to use this language. Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. This is the heart of worship. That last line, she has done a beautiful thing to me. The heart of worship, it's for God and for nobody else. Yeah, we're in a community. It's fellowship for sure. And there's something powerful about the united voice of the people of God together. But worship is for Christ, not for the Christians. Verse 7, for you always have the poor with you. This is actually a charge to go be with those who are on the outside. And whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body before hand for burial. She knew. She knew what was going to happen. I remember two days before Passover, two days before the cross, last verse, where we started. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the entire world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. This woman was an awe of Jesus. This woman has been through it in her life. The weight of sin was on her shoulders, but she knows the one who reclines at the table the one whose presence is in the house, the one that she's going to have to make a pathway through judgment and opinions to get to, she knows that one is the one who took her sin, who loves her, who accepted her, who welcomed her, and made her a new creation. And she's in awe of him. She was so focused on Jesus that she didn't care who else was in the room or their opinion of her worship. And so here's a question I'll end with and the question I was asking myself through the message and the time in the scriptures. Where I stand and where you are We're on this side of the cross, the other side of the cross. We have awareness of the cross, of the tomb, and that the tomb is empty. It's interesting because she was on the other side of the cross, but she understood the cross. She understood the tomb and that there was going to be an empty tomb. So much that she came here not just to anoint Jesus in worship, but to anoint him to prepare him for burial before he was even crucified. 
There wasn't one disciple in the room who understood that. Not one scholar, not one scribe, not one religious leader, not one lawyer, not one person in the room who understood that at this point in the timeline of the Gospels except for this one woman of who he is and what he was going to do and what it meant for her life. And so here's what's crazy. Where we stand on this side of the cross, where she stood on that side of the cross, don't we have the same understanding of the cross? So think about where her worship was actually coming out of. Her worship was actually coming out of this place of the of foreknowledge of this future reality. There will be a crucified and risen Savior. That's what we know. And out of that, her expression of worship, could it be that the way that she expressed herself in worship is actually the prelude? It's actually the primer of how the worship of Jesus should look like. Maybe that's what Jesus is getting to when he says when the gospel is proclaimed wherever in the entire world, she will be spoken of as a memory or memorial to her. I think her worship of Jesus is a prelude this is how you worship the Savior. Breaking through the barriers of opinions and judgments and inhibitions, breaking through what you thought was your security and safety, getting to the presence of the Savior and lavishly pouring out your whole self upon him. And that is worship. And so those at the gathering, the binocular people saw this. And what were their words? And it's heartbreaking. They saw the worship towards Jesus and they said, that's a waste. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. What you did for me was a beautiful thing. Breaking through, pouring out worship of Jesus. Amen. If you're new with us or if you haven't yet, we're going to receive communion. There are a few little tables around if you want to take it with us. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, so this is two days after the story we just read. Jesus took the bread at the table and he prayed, he blessed it, he gave thanks, if you can. And he broke it, if you can break your bread. Jesus said, this is my body, 
which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive the bread. The dinner continued that night for Passover. And they got to this other point in the mill where there was multiple cups and one of those cups, Jesus lifted it up. And after supper, he said, this is the cup, which is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And let's take the cup. It'd be cool, let's stand together. And out of the heart that we, I think in Paul's words real quick to Timothy, he says scripture is for teaching. Scripture is for correcting. Let's allow the scripture of the story of the woman in the house of Simon to teach us in our heart posture of worship right now and to correct our worship and to align it with the way of Jesus. Let's worship God together.
this morning. I want to stop playing because I can't really talk and play at the same time.
Good morning, everyone. Everyone good? Yeah, if you would, let's stand together this morning. I just got to share a few words and then uh, we're going to continue in worship. But the song's powerful, right? One of those reminder songs, who we are. And it's Mother's Day. We all know that today is a day culturally where we celebrate motherhood and those sorts of things. But like any expression in this life and the things that we do out of our hearts, God's definition of those things is so much more important than our definition, right? And uh, as we're looking at this morning, you know, I was processing and just kind of reflecting myself. You know, the pathway to motherhood is so diverse for so many of us, right? So many ways in that door to expression of motherhood, whether that's biological or adopted or mentorship. And there's a lot of journey that comes through that door into motherhood. And a lot of that journey can be defined by how the world defines those things, whether it be media or friends or our negative or positive experiences. The world has many definitions of what it means to be worthy or be loved or be courageous or be able or strong. But today on a day like this, when we think about Mother's Day and motherhood, whoever you are, wherever you are in this room as you express that motherhood, Remember this, that no matter what the story is for you in your expression of motherhood, the world's definition of what it means to be worthy will wear out. What it means to be courageous will wear out. What it means to be strong will actually make you feel weak eventually. Loved will make you feel left behind. Treasured, maybe undervalued. Able, not possible. But in Christ, who looked at us from heaven, became flesh, came to dwell with us, died for us, resurrected for us, inhabits us through the Holy Spirit, giving us fruits of his spirit, giving us the things of God, screaming inside the hearts of women as mothers. Those things are able based on his definition, right? And so as you look at the children or those you mentor or those that you lead in your life, remember that the testament that you're giving is not one that comes from you. It comes through your willingness, your surrender, your sacrifice, but it ultimately comes from God. You're growing up into the things that God said being a mother is. And in that, the journey never dies. It never goes away. But if you abide in the definition of the world on what those things mean, courageous, strong, love, treasured, able, you will never look like those Instagram or social media posts that tell you this is what a mother is because it's not real. What's real is your sacrifice and your surrender to the things of the spirit that makes you into an expression of motherhood that aligns with the heart of God. Remember that. And in that, you're leaving an inheritance that will transcend beyond your generation into the next and the next. That's a deposit that's guaranteed because it's not about you, is it? Greater is he that is in you, right? The spirit that is, is at work within you. And so I'm going to pray a blessing over you who operate in this expression of motherhood in this world that is a place that needs light that needs salt, that needs truth, that needs the way of Jesus. If you're a mother, would you just put your hands out and if you live in an expression of motherhood, put your hands out in a posture of receiving and I'm just gonna pray a blessing. God, we just ask right now that your Holy Spirit would fill this room in a powerful way. Our culture acknowledges mothers today, but biblically, truthfully, Holy Spirit wise, we acknowledge what mothering is. God, would you bring gifts into our families through motherhood? Would you bring gifts into our community through mothering, through expressions of mother amongst us? God, would you be the voice through mothers? God, would you be the measuring stick of what it looks like to be successful? Would you comfort those that are sacrificing so much for the lives of others in that expression of mother? You're good. This is your design, God. And it functions well when we operate according to that design. So I pray a blessing over the women that are an expression of mother in our gathering this morning. I pray for the truth to be seen, for satisfaction to be found in Christ, for true rest to be tasted and known. 
for life and freedom to be about the business of the house, about the business of children, about the business of mentees as they are mentoring other younger women. Father, we desire this in our community. You be the story in the middle of this. As we transition again into singing, the Psalms say, bless the Lord, O my soul. And that word bless, as we're looking at more expressions of worship this week again in our, our teaching and through worship, obviously, the word bless means to, to cause to kneel or to bow down or to put yourself low before. And I think in many ways, our worship kind of puts us back in the right place between us and God so that God truly is glorified. And so as we sing, as we engage this morning, step like further into that. I mean, I know it sounds like a pastor's telling me to worship harder and more, or not the case. I'm encouraging you in what I know is good for you, what I know is good for me. Let yourself go into Jesus. So healthy, so good. Spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Spur one another on in worship. This is the space where we do this together. So Father, move. Be you and, and we will just be your children. You be you, we'll be your kids. You be you, we'll be your people. You be God. We will be creation that gives God glory. Let's just continue.
Jesus' name. 